In this video, we're going to go through 1.2 Elements of Life, and we're going to be diving into the framework of this. And in the framework, there's, I believe there's two main components, but they have two subcomponents. So it's almost like four points that you need to know for this uh, topic. And the first one is, organisms must exchange matter with the environment to grow, reproduce, and maintain organization. And the second one is atoms and molecules from the environment are necessary to build molecules. And the biggest one that we're going to be talking about in here is carbon, uh, because carbons are used to build uh, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. And that's inside the next lecture about macromolecules. But carbon is a, a really essential component um, or element. And the second one that we're going to be talking about is nitrogen, because they are used to build proteins and nucleic acids, which are also really important. And uh, nitrogen is also important because uh, they're part of phospholipids. So they give phospholipids its unique characteristics um, in comparison to like let's say another lipid. So uh, we'll also be talking about that. So the first one, carbon. Carbon is the backbone of biologic molecules. So basically, carbon is important. Most uh, chemicals are based off of carbon. And it's really important. And you'll see that the structure of carbon like lends its way for its importance. Um, but one important fact to know is that all macromolecules involve carbon. And uh, in contrast, let's say you're comparing another important element, like nitrogen. Not all macromolecules have nitrogen, but all of them do have carbon. And it's so important that there's actually an entire like sequence of chemistry de dedicated specifically to studying carbon, uh, and that's ergo organic chemistry. And if you can form like a whole year class based off of just one element, that gives its indication for its importance. And one of the reasons why it's so important is because of its electron configuration. So if you look at this uh, electron configuration right here, we see two valence electrons or two electrons inside its first shell, and we have four valence electrons outside. So a stable octet indicates eight electrons. So if carbon has four electrons, um, what that means is it needs four more electrons, and that's four directions that can be formed off of uh, carbon. And it's one of the only elements. It is the only element that can have as much versatility as that. Um, and because of that, it's, it gives it this thing called a tetravalence characteristic. And its tetravalence characteristic is what allows it to be so flexible and uh, versatile, which is essentially like one way to think about this element and also think about why it's uh, so useful and so applicable to everything else. It's because uh, its structure and the number of valence electrons that it needs uh, creates like a perfect environment for that. And the next slide right here dives into that. Excuse the bad handwriting. Um, it's from it's actually an image that's uh, pasted in. So if you look at this right here, there's four bonds that you can make, and the uh, shape of it is a tetrahedral. So what that means is uh, a tetrahedral tetra four. Just think of it like it has four different locations that's bonded here. But another thing that you could do is a carbon double bond. Uh, carbon, like let's say double bonds to another carbon, you see that a lot in uh, unsaturated fats. And we'll talk about that in macromolecules, but the difference between like a saturated fat and an unsaturated fat is the number of double bonds that are there. Like an a unsaturated fat is a tetrahedral. It doesn't have any double bonds, whereas a, sorry, a saturated fat is a tetrahedral, no double bonds. An unsaturated fat has a double bond right here. So it creates a trigonal planar, uh, which is more stiff than the tetrahedral. There's less room for it to rotate around. And then you can also have a linear, so you can have a triple bond to a single bond or two double bonds. So really there's so many different uh, bonds that can occur off of this one element. And Compared to the others, um, if you want to look at the four, like four of the main elements that are essential to life, I think it makes up like, I believe like 96% is uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, 
and hydrogen. So hydrogen over here, one valence electron. Um, carbon has four, nitrogen has five, oxygen has six. So carbon is the most versatile of those four elements. So it's also like why it's used as one of those examples. Uh, when you see a periodic table, like it's carbon is like a central example that many periodic tables have in like describing how to read it. So here is a example of a bond that can occur. Um, the first one, we have a linear formation because we have two double bonds. And this one right here is CO2, carbon dioxide. And another thing that you can have is urea. So urea, you have, uh, this is a trigonal planar, so you have double bond to the oxygen and single bonds to uh, these groups right here. And urea is found in urine, and it was actually synthesized. So the specific number of electrons like allows for many different types of bonds to form, and it's actually still stable. So in other elements, if you have, let's say, a double bond in that element, it, the element's no longer stable. But for carbon, you can still have double bonds and single bonds and even a triple bond and still have a very stable molecule. So essentially, th think about like carbon lends its way to stability based off of its uh, octet. Okay, we'll go ahead and talk about a carbon skeleton now. So a carbon skeleton is basically a chain of carbons, and I wish I could pull a picture. Um, so a chain of carbons, you can have it like written out like a bunch of C's, and then you see the bonding, or you can have just like a zigzag. So a zigzag indicates that there's a carbon at each of the corners. Um, I'll go ahead and draw it out in class, but essentially a carbon skeleton is a chain of carbons. So carbons can form a bunch of chains to itself and it can vary in the type of bond so it could be a single bond double bonds and where that carbon is uh, creates like a lot of complexity and diversity in different molecules that are out there so uh, one thing that you see very commonly is a hydrocarbon so carbon bonds to hydrogens and you have a bunch of carbons bonded to each other so what you have is you have a chain of carbons and each of those carbons have hydrogens and that's a hydrocarbon so if you want to just break it down hydro hydrogen carbon carbon and um, one thing that you could also do is if you click on the links at the bottom from the slides um, you can actually go to once this loads but you can go to the site where the information uh, where this information is and it allows you to like see more about uh, what where I got the information and also like uh, its importance. So I was talking about how uh, carbon skeletons lead to variety. So uh, one reason why carbon is important because it gives way to so many different molecules and so many different uh, variations can occur from that. For example, if we want to look at this, I took this picture straight from recent Campbell. So if you have two carbons right here and you have hydrogens attached to it, that's an ethane. But now let's say you add one carbon to it with hydrogens, now you have propane. And um, if you add, like, let's say another carbon, now you have butane. And if you just rearrange uh, one of those carbons, so you take one of these carbons right here and you stick it to the middle carbon, so like the second carbon right here, now you have something called 2-methylpropane, or it's also called isobutane, and like the uses of these are so different, and all you're really doing is just adding a carbon to it. So for example, ethane, it's a gas, and it's just like colorless glass gas, and it, you can also use it in like plastic, uh, or antifreeze. And then propane is uh, it's like a propellant, so it's used as like ignition. You can use that for like stoves. Like your stove, you may have a propane stove where you have like that gas and then it ignites. Now you have that flame, that's from propane gas. Butane on the other hand is like, uh, you can also have butane stoves. So like a lot of camping stoves are, uh, they use butane. It's a different type of like propellant. It's like liquefied petrol. Um, 
and it's used for like cooking. So you have like so many different like uses for uh, carbon and you have so many variations just based off carbon. You can even form hexanes. So this right here is a cyclohexane. It's this is what I meant by the zigzag. So instead of writing out all the carbons, it looks messy. Um, what we do in organic chemistry is we actually just draw out like lines and each of these corners right here represents a carbon. And assumed with that carbon are hydrogens attached to it um, to make it stable. And if you see two lines, that's actually a double bond. So you have a double bond to a carbon right here. So there's carbon double bonded to another one, which is double bonded or single bonded here because there's only one line and double bonded here. So essentially the point of this slide is to indicate that carbon is important because it provides and lends its way to variation um, in the diversity and structure of it. Okay, so when we were talking about how carbon can uh, move, you can like shift the carbon around, now you have something else, um, but you have the exact same molecular formula. So for example, here you have, oh, sorry, I'm pointing. Here you have four carbons, uh, you have 10 hydrogens. Here you also have four carbons and 10 hydrogens. They're the exact same uh, like formula, but the difference is in their structure. Those are called isomers. So an isomer is the same, is a molecule with the same molecular formula but with different molecular geometries. And there's many different types of isomers. So they vary in uh, like the architecture of it. So they vary in like how they're put together and what, and the, it varied by the three types. So the first type is structural, the second type is geometric, and the third one is called the enantiomers. Um, so we'll go ahead and dive into each one. I got this from both Khan Academy and Campbell and Reese, that's why you see two references here. Um, you can also click on this to get more information. But a structural isomer is um, different covalent arrangements. So essentially the carbons are at different locations. This is what you saw when you saw isobutane. Uh, oh, it's right here. So you have butane and you have isobutane. So that carbon, the only difference is that it shifts towards the second carbon. So that fourth carbon is cleaved and you put that into the second carbon. You have a different like structure to it. So the structure is different, but the molecular formula is the same. Um, and if you think about it, as you increase the number of carbon chains or the, uh, the hydrocarbon chain or the backbones, as you increase the number of carbons, the more possibilities you have um, for its arrangement. So I put it down into the notes. So, for example, pentane versus uh, C8H18 or C20H42. So if you have C8H18, there's 18 different arrangements that you can have. But if you have C20H42, now you have 366,319 different arrangements. So that's why carbon is so important. It lends its way to various uh, structural isomers or isomers in general that gives it new functions. So for example, butane used for fuel, cigarette lighters, stoves, isobutane used as refrigerants or propellants. So different uses just based off of how you change the structure. Geometric isomers. They have the same uh, covalent bonding, so you don't move a carbon around but they differ in its like spatial arrangement. So it's like rotation. Um, so you, you have to look at the numbers of this to understand it, but here you have the carbon right here, right? That's labeled carbon number one. It's at the top. Now, if you look at the uh, other carbon, the geometric isomer of it, now we have the number one carbon on the bottom. So really what you're doing is you're uh, rotating the carbon and you're changing its uh, spatial arrangement. So the one carbon at the top here, one carbon at the bottom here, creates an entirely new uh, isomer. And we're good. So
um, these are present because of the inflexibility of double bonds. So I stated earlier that double bonds are not as flexible as single bonds. Um, so what that means is double bonds can't rotate around a single axis. So like imagine you're holding like a, give me one sec. So let's say you have this wire right here, right? So this would be an example of a double bond because if I try to twist it this way, it's not going to budge. That's because it's stiff. It's structurally inflexible. Whereas, um, let's say, like I have a single bond, like I don't have a, I don't have like a thing that can twist around, but a single bond can actually like twist around. But a double bond would stay stiff, and when you try to twist it, it wouldn't work. But single bonds allow for that, so you can rotate it. So for, if you look at the second and the third carbon, they don't rotate. They actually stay the same, but the difference is that the one carbon rotates. And this creates for us cis and trans molecules. So that's just two ways of describing it. So cis or trans. So here we have... Uh, cis butene or butene but here you have trans butene I think it's kind of cut off um, so you have cis and you have a trans so it's just a way to differentiate the two different ones and if you want to think about like the trans like Golgi apparatus so like on the opposite side of it here we have the one at the top and on the trans one the one is on the other side of it And there's some uh, differences to it. So you would think that like just twisting it around wouldn't change it too much, but there's actually a lot of changes that occur from that. Um, so for example, if you have a cis isomer, it's not, it's almost always polar, whereas a trans isomer is not as polar. So it's weird. Like the moment you twist uh, that carbon to a new location from the top to the bottom, like spatial, just spatially rearrange it. Now you're making like the isomer uh, either polar or not polar based off of whether it's cis or trans. And additionally, uh, you even change like the melting point of it. So this trans one right here would be a more tighter packed molecule. And as a result of that, because it's um, tighter, uh, the melting point of it is usually higher. So all you're doing is you're shifting it around spatially and from that you're changing like the melting point. So I'm not going to go through each one of these but I would uh, pause it and yeah I would pause it and uh, go through each of these make sure that you understand them before moving on. Um, and also one thing to research is and also ask yourselves as you're listening to this is okay so we know that tighter packed molecules from a trans isomer results in a higher uh, melting point. But the, what I want you to ask is like, why does it result in a higher melting point? So like the structural, the molecular formula is the same, but the difference is uh, its spatial arrangement. And that spatial arrangement is influencing something, but you wanna look up why. Okay, the third one, stereoisomer. And in a stereoisomer, um, what happens in this one, the orientation is just different. So um, enantiomers are types of stereoisomers. So stereoisomers are like the bigger category of it. And then from there, we're going to be talking about enantiomers, which is a mirror image of each other. So you have uh, this L isomer and you have a D isomer. So if you look at this right here, if you put a line straight down the middle, you have that bromine um, like facing the mirror on the right side. Now on the D isomer, it's on the opposite side. So you're just taking a mirror image of it. And this is important because um, in one of them, it's biologically active. It, but in another one, it's not active. So it's important to understand that isomers can affect its function. So isomers can affect whether it's biologically active or whether it's biologically inactive.
So here's an example in the real world of this. Um, so Parkinson's. So uh, Parkinson's essentially impacts uh, like the dopamine producing neurons in a specific area of the brain. And the treatment for it is um, O-DOPA. So if you look back at the isomers, L-isomer is one of them and the D-isomer is the other one. So L-DOPA is prescribed uh, to uh, stimulate production of dopamine in the brain. But same exact formula, right? All The only difference is that it's flipped um, inside the D-DOPA, but D-DOPA is biologically inactive against it. So the only difference would be um, its uh, structure, like it's a mirrored image of it, but one of them is active and the other one is inactive. It's almost like an on and off switch. An on switch is the opposite of the off switch, so like up and down. So the L isomer is usually the naturally occurring one, and the D isomer is the one that's not uh, natural in terms of like active. It's not as active usually. So if you have like a drug that's a D isomer, it's usually inactive um, and the L would be the active one, which is the case inside L-DOPA versus D-DOPA. And this occurs because you have an asymmetric carbon. So if you look at this carbon right here, uh, it's called a chiral carbon. So the carbon has uh, four different groups on it. So you see like these four different elements that are attached to that carbon, it's asymmetrical. So D isomers occur when you have that type, that chiral carbon, that specific carbon, when you have an asymmetric one. So usually you'll find uh, stereo isomers when you have that chiral carbon. All right, so one question that I want you to ask and uh, put it inside your notebooks and then we'll go over it in class is what do varying effects of enantiomers in treating a disease indicate about the human body? So I want you to go ahead and ask that um, and if you want to use a specific drug uh, as, as your research I would look up thaliomide so this is actually a really interesting one because it's, uh, if you have, for example, these are just mirrored images of each other. And I guess I'm just going over the answer right now. So they're prescribed, uh, it's a drug for pregnant women, and one of them reduces the effects of morning sickness. So if you look at, um, <laughs> if you look at one of these isomers right here, so this is what I want you to research, which one is it? So one of these reduces the effects of morning sickness. But if you have the enantiomer, what happens is the other one causes birth, severe birth defects. So it's pretty crazy because it's the exact same molecular formula. It's just an isomer, but one of them alleviates symptoms that you would experience when you're pregnant, morning sickness. Um, but the other would cause like severe birth defects. So you have to make sure that you know which one is the correct uh, one to prescribe. Okay, so functional groups. Functional groups are important because they're involved, they're the actual part that's involved in the chemical reaction. And there's like a lot of different types of functional groups and they give, the pro they have specific properties. Um, so you can determine uh, like the properties of a molecule based off of what functional groups are there. You can tell if it's polar, you can tell if it's nonpolar. So for example here, I see two hydroxyl groups, uh, or one hydroxyl group right here. So I can, I have an indicator, I have an indication that this is a polar molecule. And then I can start thinking, okay, would this interact with water or would it not interact with water? So this I can tell would interact with water because it is a polar molecule. Um, whereas if there was another one that wasn't polar, I could immediately say like, okay, this one would not interact with water. And a hydrocarbon, so going to the third bullet, hydrocarbon is the simplest organic molecule. It's just hydrogen and carbons. And then when you add functional groups to the hydrogen and carbons, now it's more complex. So if you thought that there was a lot of variation that you can have in just hydrocarbons, like two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, 
There's even more once you start adding in these functional groups. Um, these are essential ones that you need to know, as well as the properties. Don't memorize it. Okay, wait. Maybe, maybe have like a good understanding of it. But I mean, it's not important to be like, okay, carbonyl is polar. Don't memorize the structure of it, um, but be able to recognize the structure of it. So if you saw a hydroxyl group, um, at least be able to recognize what a hydroxyl group looks like. So the R is where it's like a variable thing that it could be attached to. So if you ignore the R's, the actual functional group is the other one. So here, the hydroxyl functional group would just be the O and the H. The R is like, okay, something's attached there. So understand hydroxyl, carbonyl, carboxyl, amino, uh, sulfhydryl, and phosphate groups. And then the properties of it, you can kind of tell. So um, you can kind of tell things about a molecule based off of what the groups are. So for example, hydroxyl would be polar and methyl is nonpolar. And I want you to pause it, uh, go down to the description link below and if you like a YouTuber, go down to the description link and click on the Pearson BioCoach activity. Um, I want you to go through the different functional groups here because they help you like name them. They help you describe the characteristics of it. And it's a really good resource to learn about functional groups. And the importance of this is because they play a huge role in uh, DNA, proteins, carbs, lipids, the macromolecules. So they are huge in like allowing the interactions to occur within DNA, within proteins. Like it influences protein folding, depending on what functional groups are there. Uh, it's big in carbohydrates and lipids. And then they also help determine different properties. So they help determine melting, boiling point, stability, polarity, reactivity. So these are like four just different things that they influence in the molecule. So the type of functional group influences those four characteristics. And then you can infer functions based off of what groups are present. Okay, and here's one super big example of, um, of functional group interactions. So we have three phosphates right here. So three phosphates, that's super big in ATP. And if you remember, ATP is essentially, think of it like energy. So we have right here a high energy phosphoanhydride bond. So that's the bond that links the phosphates together. So we have one phosphate, two phosphate, three phosphates. Now, energy is released and essentially used when it's hydrolyzed. Hydrolyzed means to break the bonds. Use a water, hydro, to break the bond. So if you use a water to break and cleave one of these phosphate groups off, so like the phosphate group leaves, you're releasing energy in the process. And as a result, you get something called ADP. And in the process, energy is released, and it allows uh, for the consumption of ATP. But ADP can be put back to ATP state in uh, something called a condensation reaction. So when you use water to add a bond, um, you're making a condensation reaction. Now that ADP turns into ATP. So if you look at like the importance of ATP, it's not like, it's not this group right here that's important. It's not this uh, ring right here that's important. It's the functional group. It's the phosphate group that's really doing all the work and reacting. So... Um, just to summarize kind of like the past slides, this red, red point is important because carbon is used to build biological molecules such as carbs, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. Carbon is used as in storage compounds and cell formation in all organisms. So without carbon, we wouldn't have so many things. Um, like life would not exist without carbon. So carbon is important. Now, <laughs> there's like... <laughs> We talked so much about carbon, there's like two slides about nitrogen. Um, we'll be diving more about nitrogen in class two, but the important element to describe about nitrogen is nitrogen is used to build proteins and nucleic acids. So whereas carbon was like a huge role in four of them, proteins is, a, or nitrogen is a huge role in two of them, proteins and nucleic acids. So it's a key component in photosynthesis.
uh, for example, chlorophyll specifically, DNA, nucleic acids, RNA2, and proteins and amino acids. So one example of it is a phospholipid bilayer. So we have a hydrophobic tails. Remember, the, this is right here is a hydrocarbon chain. It's a backbone, carbon backbone. So you have a bunch of carbons here. And then you have a glycerol group. Now, with just the uh, hydrocarbon chain, it's hydrophilic. It doesn't want to interact with water, or hydrophobic, sorry. It doesn't want to interact with water. But once you add in a functional group, phosphorus, into it, um, now you have a super, you have a super important aspect to it because now it's also hydrophilic. So now it's amphiphatic, which means that it has properties of both hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So hydrophobic from the carbon backbone or the carbon chain, and then you add in a phosphate group, and now it's hydrophilic. So it adds in the interaction of water into the phospholipid bilayer. So just like how nitrogen is used to build proteins and nucleic acids, Phosphorus is used to build nucleic acids in certain lipids. So this is the example of that lipid. So one thing that you can kind of do inside your notes is say carbon, nitrogen, and uh, phosphorus is important in nucleic acids. And then nitrogen is also important in proteins. Phosphorus is important in lipids, certain lipids, the ones who are hydrophilic. Whew. Okay, so that wraps up like the basics of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, phosphorus and nitrogen were kind of brief, so what I want you to do is research more on that. Um, and make sure that you go back to the first slide. Uh, make sure that you go back to this slide right here and understand that uh, nitrogen, so part B right here, nitrogen is used to build proteins and nucleic acids. And also understand that phosphorus is used to build nucleic acids in certain lipids. So that's an important part of the understanding of 1.2. And here are some resources, about an hour and 20 minutes of extra supplemental uh, resources that you can use to learn more about carbon, functional groups, and nitrogen and phosphorus.